series, but uh, not this week. We'll go one more week on revisiting things that churches do. The mic working, sir? Thank you. Uh, this week I want to cover the empty tomb, which is not a subject foreign to today's sermon subjects all across the world in churches since uh, today is the, the, uh, the created holy day of Easter. I say created because it's not biblically defined, uh, but it's rather something that tradition has invented as a special day. Uh, of course, the events that uh, surround Easter you find in the scripture, at least if you're talking about the resurrection of Christ, um, other events such as uh, Peter Cottontail invented otherwise. But uh, meanwhile, we've been covering for the last month or two what churches do. And I thought it was appropriate to cover this week what churches do in celebrating Easter as a holy day because it is something that people see outside the church as something churchy, as something, this is what Christian, it's, it's Christian, right? It's, it's Easter. And so let's cover that as we revisit the empty tomb and what the Bible says about it and make sure we're operating according to truth regarding that. And uh, many people participate, especially around Easter in this last week and the so-called Holy Week, in programs and services and performances and pageants, uh, recreating the empty tomb. And so they literally revisit the empty tomb every year at Easter. And so I just want to talk about the day and why doing that actually brings more emptiness than one might think. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like a very hopeful message on Easter. Well, we'll get to the hope, because there's a hopeful message of Jesus Christ, and in the scriptures, something that we should all know and walk in, and it's often something left off when it comes to Easter performances, services, and pageants. And so it's interesting, the, the day that the, the church would, would say, this is the day of hope, this is the season of hope, and flowers and spring and sunshine uh, is, unfortunately, they often come short of the message of that. And so that's a strange thing, but we deal with that. Overwhelmingly today, of course, in the church, the empty tomb uh, preaches, when people try to preach the empty tomb, it preaches an empty or a hollow gospel. Yes. Uh, when the gospel is preached, and I'm all for the gospel being preached anywhere and by any church, if they preach the gospel clearly, uh, what, what you're seeing in churches often is an unclear gospel, yes. is a missing gospel, an incomplete gospel, a hollow gospel, a gospel that is more about a uh, tradition or more about uh, you doing and following the sufferings of Christ, and it is trusting Christ's finished work. Amen. And so we'll be dealing with that this morning as well. So that's what's happening in church today. But overwhelming the church, beyond the church today, are chocolates and eggs and flowers and jelly beans and bunny baskets. And that, more than anything else, is what most people think of as Easter. And so every year around this time, you have the preachers and the churches and the more pious Christians among you who are going, no, that's not what Easter is really about. Easter is really not about the chocolates and the bunnies and gaslighting the rest of us because that's what everybody sells at the stores around the season. You know, it's not about the bunnies and the, and the jelly beans and the Easter eggs and the flowers. Well, actually, maybe it is spiritually, metaphorically, and symbolically, but it's about Jesus and the resurrection. It's about his raising from the dead. And so what is Easter uh, without the plastic grass? In the baskets. What's Easter without the Roman Catholicism and the popery and the, and the traditions there? Uh, there's so many things in church history and traditions that they celebrate around Easter, and they do around Easter that a lot of you know nothing about. We dealt a couple weeks ago with the anointing. Remember that? And I mentioned how this last Thursday, uh, one of the things that you probably never been a part of is the Holy Anointing Service and the the Chris Mass, not Christ Mass, yeah. but the Chris Mass, where they take the anointing, the christening oil and make it sacred for the next year. And they do it every week on Holy Week, because that's something they do on Holy Week. Well, that, that is, that's not something we do at our house, and that's not part of Easter. Well, it actually is a part of religious uh, Easter, as uh, the popes and Roman Catholic Church defines it. And then there's the pageantry. What is Easter without the pageantry, without the recreating of the tomb, right? So you take away the, the bunnies and the chocolates, which everyone recognizes as consumerism, and then you take away the Roman Catholicism, and you take away the pageantry and the performances. What is there that's left? I might suggest to you that it would be like any other Sunday in the church, which is where we teach the resurrection of Christ and what he did for us in the gospel. Amen. So it's really Easter itself is as empty as the tomb. So people will say that the resurrection, of course, and this is true, the resurrection of Christ is at the heart of Christianity. And this is something we learn from the Bible. And so to the extent that the Easter performances, pageantry, messages, talk about the resurrection of Christ, then praise God for communicating the resurrection of Christ, and as we'll learn today, more importantly, why that matters. Yes. It's one thing to believe that Christ rose from the dead, it's another thing to understand why, yes. right? which many people unfortunately leave Easter services not knowing, which is interesting since that's the day about the resurrection supposedly. 
So the resurrection of Christ is at the heart of Christianity, but the Easter holy day is not. And I want to make that distinction today a little bit. Separating the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ, which is something that where Christ resurrected from the dead 2,000 years ago. He did it. It's done. He performed it. The power was displayed. He's alive today. He's alive today in heavenly places. He's alive today, and that's important not just because he rose from the dead, but because what he's doing today is creating a body of which he is the head. Amen. What he's doing today is actually saving people by his intervention, by his spirit through you. And so if he's not alive, none of that's possible. You see, the church doesn't exist without him being alive. So the resurrection is at the foundation of all of that. But Easter, as a day, as a holy day, is not the heart of Christianity, folks. At the very best, it is a day, a day of, one day of celebration annually. At the worst, it's a distraction and a covering up of the importance of what Christianity really is. Amen. But again, some of you go, how can you say that on this holy of holies, this day today? The Easter holy day is not the heart of Christianity, folks. And most churches, attendance increases at this day, which is why you've seen all over town posters describing the, the Easter services. Sometimes they'll have multiple services, right? Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because attendance increases. Why does attendance increase at Easter? Except for grace ambassadors and those who rightly divide, apparently. But why do attendance increase on this day? It is not due to faithfulness to the doctrine. Okay, do not deceive yourselves about that. Attendance does not increase on Easter because people think, we all agree on the doctrine of the resurrection. It's foundation of Christianity. So let's all go out to church on this day and remember. It's, that's not happening. Attendance increases on Easter because culturally, as remnants of religious Christianity go, there are two days that seem to give you more brownie points with God than others. That being Easter and Christmas. Everybody knows, right? And so if you're going to go out someday, and if there's going to be an, an addition to that, a family gathering and a feast and everything else, then why not go? If I'm nominally Christian and I'm going to pick one day that is better than the rest, there you go, Christmas and Easter. That's why. Because the day has been communicated, the day itself has been communicated as a special day. That's why attendance increases, right? Come out on this day. It's a similar reason why our visitors and guests, we sometimes have visitors and guests on different days at Grace Ambassadors where we have communion meals or we have last Tuesday dinners, and that's just fine that, it is, that people come out for that. We, we encourage that. If you're gonna travel 500 miles, then come out on a time where we're here longer, eating together, and more things going on. And so that, that's why, why that's happening, okay? We do not pretend that people come out on our communion meal or our last Tuesday dinners because they're more faithful to doctrine on those days. It's because there's things going on on those days. But Christ crucified and Christ resurrected is the church's foundation, yes? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, Paul said to the Corinthians, I determined not to know anything among you save Christ and him crucified. Amen. And so the crucifixion of Christ, the burial in the tomb, the resurrection is the central part of human history and in the Bible and in this dispensation. When Christ died on the cross, was put in the tomb, the stone rolled away, and he rose from the dead. That's the gospel that saves you today, that's the resurrection. But that, Christ crucified and resurrected, the church's foundation is not one day a year. Amen. Right? So, oh, yes, we know that. It's just the one day we remember it. Are you sure you want to go there? It's like, no, you should remember it more than one day. So, yes, of course, pastors always say this. You come out to one church one day a year in Easter, and they always tell us you should be here every week. Yeah, that's true. It's very cliche. Uh, but that's the fact of the matter doctrinally, is that if it's the foundation of the church, that it's not something that we just remember once a year. In fact, Jesus nowhere in the scripture tells us to remember once a year the foundation of the church. Thus, the day Easter being something invented, separate from the doctrine. In fact, the only thing, the only special gathering that Christ our Lord tells us to do in remembrance of him is, based on what I just said, you realize the Lord's Supper, the communion of the saints, which no one thinks is a one once a year activity, right? It's not a holy day. It's the gathering of holy people in the church. That's what that is. But we've dealt with that in previous lessons. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul warns us that there will be a time where people will forget what the important thing is. And I can't help but think whether that's the case in some of these inventions of religious Christianity that seem to overcome what the Bible actually teaches about what happened through Christ's resurrection. 2 Timothy 4, verse, 
Verse 2, Paul says, preach the word, the word of God, the scripture, the Bible, the Holy Bible inspired by, by God. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Be prepared, ready, be available, be focused on preaching the word in season, out of season. Not one season or the other. Amen. Not in one season or the other. Now, of course, Paul's not talking about holiday seasons at all, but it definitely is included in the application here that in every season, preach the word, right? So to say we're going to, this day, preach the word of the foundation of the church, the heart of Christianity, is really diminishing you know, the seasons in which we should do that, which should be everyone. It's interesting, on this day, there's so much importance given by Christians, and rightly so, each day, to the resurrection of Christ. Where did we, where was all this communication about the resurrection of Christ in the heart of Christianity three or four months ago? Where was that? Then the most important thing was God incarnate and the birth. But the resurrection is the beginning of the gospel of Christ. Amen. It is the power of your salvation. That's what should have been preached three months ago, two months ago, one month ago, today, right? 74 verse 2 says, In season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, which is not a very Easter thing to do. <laughs> reprove, rebuke, and exhort. I mean, on this day among all days, especially when you have people coming out for various reasons, uh, why not preach the good news of Jesus Christ and not the bad news of reprove, rebuke, and exhortation, right? With all long suffering, I mean, really, are we going to long suffer today? It's Easter Day, you know. You see how people talk and think about these things. Long suffering in doctrine. Do we need so much doctrine today? Can't we just rejoice in Christ? Well, yes, you should. But he tells us to preach the word in season and out with reproof, long suffering, and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they lust lust things that they want, things that they want to do, things that they find pleasure in. They, after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. If you're going to speak doctrine and make an issue about the, the problems with what churches do on any given day, we're going to find someone that doesn't do that. What do you call that? Finding a teacher that itches your ears. It's precisely what's going on. So though Christ crucified and resurrected is the church's foundation, it's not about the day, right? That's just a fact of the matter. If faith is not seen, by the way, and we know that faith is not seen, Hebrews 11, 1 says the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7 says. Faith comes as a result of you hearing the word of God that people preach, that you're to preach in season and out of season, in doctrine, sound doctrine. If that's what faith is, then doesn't recreating visually in a performance as a theater for everyone cheapen the idea of faith in the very events you're trying to pretend to put on. Yeah. Just curious. Now, the opposite side of that question is that, well, no, no, we're, what we're doing is trying to make it real for people. Isn't faith real? Yes. Do people need to see to believe? Hmm? If no, then what are we doing? If yes, we need to see, then what is faith? See, there's a dilemma here at the very essence of recreating the tomb in Easter pageants and performances. It's the same problem, by the way, that we'll see a little bit later, happens when people create movies and TV shows about Jesus. Of course, they're doing it there more to entertain, but aren't they doing that at Easter as well? To entertain people that we like to see how things happen. We want to be there. And that's fun. I understand the appeal. I understand that, yes, it would have been wonderful to, to see what would have happened on that, uh, all throughout Scripture, the events that occurred, right? But doesn't play acting the death and resurrection cheapen faith? If what we're recreating at the empty tomb at Easter with the Easter pageants and the recreations thereof, if what we're recreating is the content of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because here's the empty tomb, and what happens, in, here's the pageants right here. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's the subject, the historical narratives of Jesus' earthly ministry. If this is what we're recreating, then Easter excludes, here's the revelation of the mystery given to Paul after the resurrection and ascension. Then this, which is what people try to remember at Easter, right? 
Mrs. Easter, excludes that. Am I right? So, so I, I'm trying to help us understand. You say, well, what is the problem with uh, biblical performances and, and, res, and resurrection and all that? It's in the Bible. Okay, is it in the Bible or is it not? What does the Bible say? What does God wants us, want us to do? It's not simply about tradition, or is it? And of course, that's the reality. It's, it's about very much church tradition. It's very much about, especially after 100 years of consumerism in America, about the children yeah. and about chocolate eggs, which are delicious. And uh, no matter what shape chocolate takes, it, it will add to your hips. You know, it's just that delicious. Um, whether it's crosses or bunnies or whatever. I mean, it can be any animal, you know, and it'll be fine. But there's a missing, something missing from the Easter performance, which is the mystery of Christ. Second Peter 2, verse 8, Paul says that Jesus Christ, or the seed of David, was raised from the dead. Amen, Easter message. What's Paul say? According to my gospel. Paul preaches something about the resurrection of Christ that was revealed in the mystery. Amen. That was unknown before. We'll see that here as we study scripture today. There was a teaching about the resurrection of Christ that was not known here before he died. Was not known back here in prophecy. Was not known when he rose from the dead. And it wasn't even known by the apostles after Christ explained that he had to raise from the dead and that he, after they saw him risen. What, the, what is that? If resurrection is the foundation of the church, which it is, then what is the teaching of resurrection? What is that foundation? Is it just Jesus rose from the dead? It's more than that, folks. Amen. It's not simply that event, as we'll see. It's not simply the empty tomb. Look in there. It's empty, right? Is it? We'll explore that a little bit today. But the foundation of Christianity is not the empty tomb. It's the power of God in Jesus Christ Amen. to save all that belief through his finished work. And you say, well, yeah, I hear that preached at Easter, but you don't find it here in the Bible. And so this is the confusion for many people have. Things that concern Easter, like Lent, there's been empty stomachs for the, well, not really. No one really starves themselves for 40 days, do they? No. Not really. They don't eat meat. And by meat, they mean no beef and, and, and chicken, right? Is that right? Pork, no beef, pork, and chicken. You can eat fish. Yeah. Right? You can eat fish. And you can eat, you can eat eggs, even. So you can eat animal products, you know, like that, eggs and milk, stuff like that. Um, and that's only on Fridays, by the way, right? <laughs> it's Friday. So, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, steak. Friday, no steak. That's Lent, Lenten fasting, right? And Sundays don't count. So you know, lots of rules there in religion. Lent is not found in the Bible at all as an instruction. Amen. Which the objection is, wait a minute, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, not as a pattern for you. Jesus also was God manifest in the flesh. Try doing that. Yeah. You can't do it. Right? Isn't there a benefit to fasting? That's not the point. Okay, the point here is that recreating Easter and the Lent, the walking of the Via de la Rosa, Via, way, de la Rosa, of suffering, the way of suffering. If any former Catholics here, you understand the stations of the cross, maybe. They used to have things in the stained glass windows in churches. One of the functions of that was for illiterate people because they wouldn't read the Bible, and so they had pictures. That's what you do when people can't read or you can't speak your language. You try to draw pictures for them. You try to, to mime and play act, which is part of the reason why people put on performances at Easter, though we live in a, a majorly literate country. But that's why they would put the things in the windows. The problem with the Stations of the Cross is that pictures, though they supposedly speak a thousand words, you don't know what words they are. <laughs> I mean, you're guessing the thousands of words. And there's also some interpretation of these pictures. And five of the 14 stations of the cross are not found in Scripture at all. Like, Veronica's veil, anybody? Find Veronica in the Bible. Not there. Right, it's one of the stations of the cross. And so what people will do is they look at these pictures. The way of the suffering, the, the stations of the cross, were depictions of the events. Let me try bringing this up. They were pictures of the events of Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, right? And he went to the trial among the Jews. And the events that happened to him, the sufferings that happened when they led him to be crucified. What are those events? There are 14 events that they, they according to church tradition, which like I said, five of them aren't even in the scripture, that they, they list here. So there was this way of suffering, a Via De La Rosa, which today you can go over to Jerusalem and there's the, the street, the De La Rosa street, the way of suffering. If you walk down, and people do this at Easter. They have sermons where they walk down the way of suffering to get to Calvary, where Christ died, to follow him and his sufferings. Which, by the way, is the same reason why Lent exists, in case you didn't know. You say, what's fasting going to do with any of this? 
Because Jesus suffered 40 days and 40 nights by not eating. And so people before Easter for 40 days and 40 nights fast to follow him in his sufferings. Okay? That's what they do. Every year at Easter, some of you may know, some of you don't know, but there's a, a certain sect over in the Philippines of Christians, the Filipinos, who will follow Jesus' sufferings to the point of nailing themselves to crosses. Literally. Yeah. Right? I'm not talking about like the guy with the wheels on the cross pulling it across town. We're talking about these guys stripped down to what they think they wore as criminals, and they actually put nails in their hands. Now, they don't go the full nine yards of crucifixion. They would die. Right? Crucifixion was an instrument of death. But, you know, they have a standing platform there, and they put the nails in the hands, and that hurts. And you say, why would they do that? Well, Jesus did it. He suffered. And it's a show to remind people. It's a pattern. It's like, is that what the church is supposed to do? And all of us go, oh, I'm not nailing myself to a cross. <laughs> but why? If you will fast for 40 days and walk the Villa de la Rosa, why won't you? But God never told you to do that. Amen. Christ did it. In your place. He did it for you, right? So again, we're talking about recreating the empty tomb, recreating the way of suffering, recreating the cross, recreating the resurrection every Easter in the pageantry and the performances. Why are we doing that? That's not partaking in the fellowship of the sufferings. Paul talks about in Philippians 3, partaking in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ, Philippians 3. He wants to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings and what a spiritual, spiritual man Paul was. People read this, you know. It says in Philippians 3, verse 9, He must be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. There it is. The power of, that's Easter, right? Don't read Easter into resurrection. Amen. Easter is a holy day with traditions that people have created that nowhere in the Bible it describes. Resurrection is an event that Christ performed with a doctrine that follows after that pertains to your eternal life. Yeah. That's a different thing. But Paul wants to know the power of Christ's resurrection and the fellowship of Christ's sufferings be made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Right? Paul is not saying here, I'm going to nail myself to a cross. The teaching in Scripture is not you have to nail yourself to a cross ultimately as an ultimate example, as an ultimate following of Jesus. Right? Does the Bible teach that you're dead in Christ? Yeah. Does the Bible teach that your life is not your own? Yep. Does the Bible teach that you're here for a purpose? Yeah. And that there's a greater love than he that would die for his friends, and that's God who died for sinners? Amen. Yes. And those are all teachings that are true about Christianity. But must you walk the Via de la Rosa, the Via Crucis, the suffering of Christ? Must you witness the blood and the gore and the nail scars in order for you to know his sufferings? And the answer to this is no, the Bible. Okay? And so there's a lot of myths around the sufferings of Christ and the passion of Christ. That word passion, by the way, you've heard the movie, The Passion of Christ. It was around before the movie, of course, the word passion. It had to do with Passion Week. The passion, and that word passion isn't only excited emotions of love or things like that, but it also concerns the feelings, the emotions, and thus the sufferings of Christ, the Passion Week that he suffered. Whenever you hear passion, that's what it's talking about religiously. It's speaking about the sufferings of Christ, his sufferings, the passions around that. Okay, but there's a lot of myths around this. When it comes to Easter's empty tomb, just like the creche, just like the nativity scene, which we covered before in Christmas, is something invented by religious Christianity using characters of the Bible, right? And if you don't know that, look it up. You can look it up online, if not our website, which has a list of some 25 or 30 uh, parts of the nativity scene that are just not, not biblically accurate, Right? Well, wasn't there Mary? Wasn't there Joseph? Wasn't there a baby? Yeah, all that, they're characters in the Bible, right? It's, it's like when kids get those little stickers, you know, with all the characters and they need to put them all together. That's what Christians did, yeah. right? If we're doing that, by the way, if we're just trying to put characters in the Bible together to create something that people can be glad about, I say we take Daniel, Moses, and Noah, right? Elijah, put them together, make some sort of Avenger set or something. You know, put them all together. Look at that superhero set of the Bible. And we're going to be happy about this. What's the difference? They're biblical characters. They'll remind us of all the men of faithfulness in the past, you know. Well, you know, they didn't all live at the same time. Yeah, trivial matters, right? They're not, you can't exactly do what they did. The, the powers they had, well, details. That's how people do things with the nativity and with the empty tomb, okay? The wise men weren't there that night. No. Right? They weren't there that night. They weren't in a barn, right? 
If you, re, re, they went to a town, right? It, it was a manger where the animals were at. Yeah, but it wasn't like, go out to the back 40 and there's a shed out there. But you, we've studied this in scripture already before. But just as the crash was culturally created as a way to encapsulize the story that has been created and with information from scripture about Jesus' birth, Easter's empty tomb also has a story surrounding it that many of you are familiar with. And I'm hoping to expose that a little bit this morning so you realize the, the, um, the impression that you have been given just by being in a country that has Easter tradition for a long time. And yet most of us, most of you, probably haven't studied in detail the biblical accounts of what happened, right? So what's the danger with giving a paraphrase or loosely telling a story? I tell my son stories from the Bible, and I'm not reading every time every word of the Scripture. I'm telling the story. Sometimes they're kind of loose. Sometimes it's out of order, and sometimes I have to correct that. And the problem with that is that he needs to get everything right eventually. Right? The, the, the problem with that is that if that's all you know is the story and not the actual text, then you're going to be misinformed about what happened. That's the problem. We're talking about adults here, not children. Right? You need to know. So there's a lot of myths around the, the Easter empty tomb. Okay. For example, let's just start off with this, about Easter being the day, resurrection being the doctrine, right? Let's talk about the day Easter here. Jesus died on Passover, yes? On or after, people argue about the timing, but it's Passover. He died on Passover, right? right? So yeah, so you can find the scripture of this. If you didn't know that, that's what happened. Israel's Passover meal every year, they, they, would, sack, they would kill a lamb and shed his blood on Passover, right, the Passover lamb, going back to Moses in, in, in Egypt where they were instructed by God to shed the blood of the lamb, put it on the door, doorpost. And you heard the story before where that the blood of the lamb on the doorpost was a picture and a shadow of Christ's blood, the lamb of God, on the wooden cross. And that's all biblically true, right? Jesus died on the Passover. He rose again how many days later? Three days later. See, these are parts of the story everyone just kind of knows. Can you list 15 verses to me that talk about three days resurrection? Well, I don't know the verses. I just know he rose three days later. Something you repeat over and over again. He rose from, the dead, rose from the dead three days and three nights later. Here's the problem with that. Passover is next month. So, ah, today's Easter. Really? What does that mean? We know biblically Jesus died on Passover. We know biblically he raised him dead three days later. Apart from the calculation from Good Friday to today, which no way can be three unless you're counting half days, right? Passover's next month. Unless you say the Jews got it wrong. <laughs> they miscalculated. The Passover is actually three days ago, right? Jews celebrate Passover April 22nd through 30th this year. Now, other years, it's different. The dates change. I get that. If you're East Orthodox, you celebrate Easter on May 5th. And this is where Christians come out and say, well, the day doesn't matter. That's what I'm saying. The day doesn't matter. You're the one that started saying the day mattered. Right? Biblically, we need to be informed about what the truth is. Amen. Jesus died on Passover. He rose from the dead three days later. That's a fact in the scripture. So don't say you're remembering this day as the anniversary when you don't know. Or if you do, other people get it wrong. I mean, is it the day or not? Or does it matter? Okay. I think it's ironic. Every year at Easter, I think it's, I just kind of have a little chuckle within myself because no one else, hardly anyone else gets it. So I'll see if I can explain it to you just so maybe you can appreciate. We're, we're believers of the Bible, specifically in English and the King James Bible, being God's word preserved historically in English language. We use that. We believe it. I don't know what's offensive about believing every word in my Bible. I don't understand that. But when I say things like that, people always attack me saying, you can't believe that your Bible's perfect. That's, that's amazing. I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible is God's word. God is perfect, his word's perfect, Amen. and here it is. And in the King James Bible, it's the only Bible that you can find popularly now on the shelves that has the word Easter in it, the only one. And so here I am talking about, it's not important about the day. And yeah, I believe in Acts 12, verse 4, it should be Easter. Look at Acts 12, verse 4. I think it's interesting, isn't it? The King James is wrong, they say. Why is the King James wrong? They mistranslated the word Passover to Easter. And they celebrate Easter on a day totally unrelated to Passover. Like, I just think that's funny. Do you care about such details or don't you? Acts 12, verse 4. Let's read verse 1. Now about the time Herod of the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Herod, pagan king, right? Wanted to vex those in the church. Why did he want to vex those in the church? A lot of politics. That's the bottom line, yeah. The Jews were under his rule. 
okay? This sect was causing them pain, and that's what you do in politics. The enemies of your friends are your enemies, you know. And so in Acts 12, verse, verse 2, he kills the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Parenthetical statement, tell you about the timing of these things. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, in case you didn't know biblically, the days of unleavened bread immediately followed the day of Passover. Amen. You had Passover beginning the days of unleavened bread, and then you had unleavened bread afterward. Sometimes the whole event would be called Passover, the Passover week, but it would be Passover the beginning, unleavened bread. Okay? Then it says in verse 4, when he had apprehended Peter in the days of unleavened bread, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after, here's the trouble word, Easter, to bring him forth to the people. Easter. They say, what, it shouldn't be Easter, it should be Passover. The only thing it can't be is the day of Passover, mm -hmm. because that's already over. Amen. Right? Now, usually the explanation here is, well, okay, he means like the whole week. Well, okay, you're going to stretch it that way. Easter, what does that mean? Well, people have different ideas about it. Pagan origin, Herod was a pagan king, yeah. right? The King James translators didn't think they were pagan, and they put Easter here on purpose, right? Along with many other places. Uh, in the Tyndale Bible, Easter shows up. But you know what makes this verse unique in your Bible? What happened after Passover, three days after Passover? Didn't Christ rise from the dead? Yes. Right. It can't be Passover. But if people think Easter is the resurrection of Christ, and the English translators put Easter here, talking about a day after the Passover, that would mimic the resurrection of a savior of a sect that believes that he rose from the dead, that makes sense. This is the only time in Scripture that the day of the resurrection of Jesus is alluded to after his death and resurrection. There's no other time. You say, why only here? Every other place the Greek word says Pascha. No other place after Christ's resurrection does Pascha show up referring to the day. Okay? You look up Easter, it means Passover and Easter. The dictionary. Was Herod a pagan king? Are there pagan origins to Easter? Sure, you can talk about all that stuff too. It's not wrong. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And so we're talking about days here, about myths around the empty tomb and myths about the Easter story. When's the day? That's one thing that, that is a problematic for people. Why is it that this is necessary that we follow the holy day of Easter, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox? You know, Constantine decided that in 325. Before that, was a lot of arguments. Before Constantine... People argued whether it should, Easter should be on Passover or not Passover and everything else. Constantine said, and it's not going to be Jewish. We're attaching it to something else. Constantine also, before he claimed to believe the Christian God, served other gods as well. They had spring festivals and, and things. What, what other myths are there about the Easter story in the empty tomb? The pageant story, the story here, and I thought Luke and John and the death and resurrection, the way of suffering is created for viewing, right? That's why people do the, the, the play acting. That's why they do the pageant. So people can see as if they're there. The problem with doing that, using the Bible as a script, a source text, is that the Bible doesn't have, if you've ever been in a play, right, there's like notes telling you what's going on in the background. Right? Scene one, this is the background. This is how you should walk in. You know, you should stumble this way. Then say this line. The Bible's not written that way. And so when you try to translate the Bible into a viewing experience, there's a million details of interpretation and things either left out or put in that will change what's happening from what the scripture said. That's it. Okay. Which is to say that when you create something for viewing, the pageant story being one of them in the church is what we do, church do every year, it is not the Bible. Are they taking Bible events and characters? Sure. But it's not the Bible. You got to get that, right? That's never said at the Baptist story. Like, what we're about to recreate for you in the empty tomb is not Scripture. Make sure you read your Bible to get the real story. This is just our depiction and interpretation of maybe what possibly, perhaps, probably didn't, you know. But it's not said that. Like, they, they're trying to evangelize in some senses. They're trying, well, we're trying to tell you what the Bible says. Well, then just tell me what the Bible says. When you act it out, now you're just looking different. That lady... That sister playing Mary Magdalene, she had a great performance this year. Like, the way she acted that way. How do you know how Mary Magdalene acted? The only thing you know about Mary Magdalene is in the scripture. Amen. Right? That was her interpretation. 
Who's a really good Jesus? Who's the best Jesus you've ever seen? You love these conversations among Christian circles? You ever had conversations with other Christians about all the Christian movies about Jesus and said, hey, yeah, you know my favorite Jesus? Christian Bale. You know, that's, he's great Jesus. You know, my favorite Jesus is the actual Jesus. Amen. Well, yeah, yeah, that was 2,000 years ago. No, he's still alive. Like, I thought the point of Easter was that he's still alive. So why is that guy up there playing him? Right? Just a thought. The pageant story is not the Bible. Ask Dallas Jenkins who is the creator of the TV series, now 200 million viewers, The Chosen, right? Some of you have heard of it, some of you have neglected, what have you. It's a TV series that is unique in, the, in the, 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 the visual depiction of the Bible in that it's not just a one or two hour event. It has been multiple hours and multiple seasons going very slowly through this time period, right here. And Dallas Jenkins has said multiple times, now he's not some theological authority or the Bible itself, but he says that my TV series he will complain to him about things he puts in there. Like Jesus saying he likes goat meat or he makes toilets and things like that. And it's like, really? Yeah, it's in there. But it's like these sort of things are not in the Bible, obviously. And so he gets a lot of comments about it. He says, guys, guys, Dallas Jenkins said, this is not the Bible. I'm simply making a TV series for your viewing pleasure with trying to communicate messages from the scripture. But you know, we gotta, we gotta create a lot of things. There's a lot of creative artistic license here. It is not the Bible is what he says over and over again. Well, if the Chosen's not the Bible, folks, which many people do misinterpret that, people will watch the Jesus movie and watch the Chosen and watch whatever Last Temptation of Christ and think, that's what the Bible says? It's not the Bible. Then what are we doing in church if we're doing that? Shouldn't we be teaching the Bible? He says it's not the Bible. It's too much creative license, and it's true. Even in the well-intended church pageantry, they cannot. It's just impossible to stick to the scriptures. It's not, it's not a malice necessarily. It's because you can't take this book and make it a movie. God wrote a book, not a movie script. Amen. Okay, make it a play. The empty tomb, that phrase is so commonplace when it comes to Easter. The empty tomb, let's celebrate the empty tomb. That phrase, empty tomb, does not exist a single time in the Bible you hold in your hands. Right. Say, really? Look it up. <laughs> I thought this is the day we celebrated the empty tomb. What's the empty tomb? Well, it's just another way of saying that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, fine. But I'm just letting you know what the Bible says here, some myths about the whole thing. That phraseology doesn't exist in Scripture. Okay? It's important to know that. Because these things, as part of the cultural story, become part of your vocabulary. And here you are talking to people, saying, well, the Bible talks about the empty tomb. And someone comes to you and says, okay, yeah, show me where it says that. And you're going, wait. <laughs> it's not there. The phrase isn't there. It's important to understand these things. We sing a song, trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ. How many of you understand the gospel is trusting Christ's finished work on the cross, yes? yes? Show me a verse in the Bible that says finished work of Christ on the cross. That phrase isn't there. You have to know these things. You're supposed to be workmen. You're supposed to be soldiers. You're supposed to be the, the ambassadors of God's grace. Those who communicate God's word means you need to know what God's word says. Amen. Not just the cultural story that churches create about it. Okay? You have to know the difference. Even when you're in, 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 in an art church where we're trying to, to stick to the Bible and what it teaches and that sort of thing, when you explain what the Bible says to people, you're using other words. But we as Christians need to grow to a point where we're reading the Bible for ourselves. So that the man created words to explain what I didn't know before, I can now understand completely by the words on the page. Okay? What's interesting too is you'll see a lot of words about Calvary in some places. Justin, you're making a big to-do about little things. I'm just trying to stay to the word of God in truth, to, to not offend God and his inspiration of scripture as a pattern for the church. And folks, I, I'm not the only one, as if I have to justify myself. Stephen Furtick, a mega church pastor of Elevation Church, sent an Easter seeker-friendly invite to his Easter services this weekend, okay? And man, did it cause an uproar. Not because he's a megachurch pastor, not because he's Stephen Furtick, but because the message he sent out did not contain the words resurrection or Calvary or blood of Jesus. The message was this. Hey, do you have plans for Easter Sunday? I'm heading to Easter Elevation. Would you like to join me? The music and the message are always incredible. It's honestly one of my favorite ways to celebrate the holiday. I'd love to have you my guest this year. To which the furor among Christians, evangelical Christians, was he didn't mention Christ, death and resurrection. He didn't mention 
You say, well, that's justified. Stephen Furtick, that watered-down megachurch preacher, he knows nothing about the Bible. I'm telling you. Then what are you doing in your church on Easter Sunday? Amen. Doing things that aren't in the Bible? <laughs> Hypocrisy much? It's like, I believe we should be true to the Scripture. What's funny about the uproar about Stephen Furtick not using the word Calvary, one pastor responded and said, he shed his blood on Calvary, Right? He set me free by his blood shot on Calvary. It's important. The re death resurrection is, is the heart of Easter and the heart of Christianity. That, that, that's what we need to have. In our we don't invite people to come and play pool and then jump on them with the resurrection. Pool, that's not what people do anymore, right? It used to be a youth group thing. So the, the, the consequence, the, the response was we should preach clearly to strangers and those who don't yet know the gospel what we're doing. Amen. We're preaching Jesus Christ and death and resurrection. His blood shed. That's what we're preaching. Come out and hear the message. The good news of Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's what he should have advertised, not come out and hear the music. Well, that's a different conversation. I think it's funny that they were arguing about the word Calvary, which only shows up in your King James Bible. Amen. The word Calvary is not ESV or NIV or New America Standard in the Bibles they use in their churches. So he didn't use it in his invitation, but they don't use it in their Bibles. It's a mess out there, folks. You say, how do you save yourself from the mess? You have to know what's going on. You have to know what the Scripture says. Because it doesn't matter what Steve, Stephen Furtick mailed out or what the response was to him. It doesn't matter what the pageants are going. It doesn't, that, none of that matters. What matters is you understanding what the Bible says. Because God wrote this book for you to be a man of God, truly furnished in all good works. Amen. But if you're believing what someone's told you about it and not knowing for yourself, then you're suscept, susceptible to deception, yeah. to following a tradition that has no biblical basis. Like Easter? Can I say that? <laughs> I believe in the resurrection, folks, the doctrine of the scripture. Nowhere do I find the instruction to celebrate a day like today. Teach the doctrine? Yes. Every day. Live it. Every day. Amen. So, it's interesting. Some of the myths that surround Easter, including the word Calvary, which shows up a lot around this time of year, the word Calvary. And I say, great, let's bring back the King James Bible. But no one understands that argument. It's only found in Luke 23, 20, 33 in the King James Bible. By the way, the empty tomb was not entirely empty. Say, wait, no, what, Justin? Jesus rose from the dead. His body wasn't found there. Okay, so you have the Easter pageants, right? And on the stage of the Easter pageants, you have a giant round rock. It's like that because they couldn't afford more rock, right? They had to make it just a little larger than the doorway, which is like this. And so you have the empty tomb. And what do you have at the end of the Easter pageant? Three days later, you have the guards, sometimes the guards next to the tomb. You maybe have this, the, a sound of thunder because the earthquake, the Bible says the earthquake happened. And you see, walking out of the tomb, your pastor, dressed as Jesus. Right? Um, I know by empty tomb, Christians mean he's not dead anymore. But that's not an empty tomb. And that's not how it happened. Amen. Nowhere in the Bible does it describe Jesus walking out of the tomb. See, what are you talking about? He had to walk out. How do you know? In Luke 24, he appeared in a room. He didn't open doors, as far as I can read. Right. right? So, well, yeah, but we're just trying to give people, what, the experience? That doesn't, the Bible doesn't describe? Like, you see, there's things put in the story to make it for better. It's better viewing, folks, when he walks out. Like, look at that. The sun's shining behind him, you know, and then the, and it catches on fire in the background. You're, you've seen that one? Disaster. Easter disa pageant disaster. When, when the, the, the lights that were causing the backlit from the Jesus walking out caught the tomb on fire because it wasn't real rock, you know. And disaster. But, you know, Jesus kept walking out, folks. They are they're spraying that fire down. It's great. It's great. This is what happens when, you, you know, it's, it's fun stuff. That's what Easter is, fun, right? It's a time for the church to have fun. No, no, you know, no. Interesting. The tomb wasn't entirely empty. Look at Mark 16. You know, the ladies went back to the tomb. They revisited the tomb. They, they went there to put Jesus' body in the tomb. And then three days later, they went back to the tomb, right? And they went back there, not expecting, now here's the ladies, the ladies who loved Jesus, who believed, uh, Mary, Martha, they believed he was the son of God, Right? We're not going back to the tomb with baskets waiting for him to come out. You know, I forgot the baskets, but they weren't waiting for him to come out. You understand that, right? 
Because sometimes, not in every pageant, sometimes the way they depict the events here is that the ladies were there and Christ comes back. They go, yay, finally. They weren't waiting for that. They were going back saying, he's been dead three days. He probably stinks. We need to put some oil over there, you know. These were believers. And they didn't know about his resurrection. What does that mean? At the very least, it means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in those books depicting the apostles and the disciples and their faith in the Son of God was not including faith in the resurrection. That means the core and heart of Christianity, which is the resurrection, was not found here. Right? But that would totally upend the things we teach other 51 weeks of the year. Maybe you should conform your practice and doctrine to the Bible. Amen. And then it would change the way church is done, which is kind of the point of our series, Revisiting the Church. But Mark 16, verse 5, here's the ladies coming back earlier in the morning, the first day of the week. They came in verse 2. They came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone in the door of the sepulcher? They, they weren't asking rhetorically, we know God's going to. They didn't know that. When they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great, and entering into the sepulcher, what happened there? When's the last Easter pageant you saw anyone go inside that tomb? They're all waiting outside. Jesus is going to walk out. Like, everyone's got to see it. You know, the empty tomb wasn't empty because the ladies walked in. The stone was rolled away, and they walked in, it says, and they saw a man. Finally saw Jesus. Now, that's not Jesus. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, be not affrighted. You seek Jesus. This is an angel. So who's in the tomb? The angel. Now, oftentimes you'll see some being with wings sitting on top of the tomb, which Matthew depicts an angel on top of the stone. But there was more than one angel, most likely. Definitely. Biblically, more than one angel. How do I know? Because in John, it says there were two men sitting inside. There were at least two, maybe three or four angels around that empty tomb. And they were just sitting there, praise God, hallelujah chorus. They were talking to the ladies, explaining to them what to do. You're looking for Jesus, he's not here. Go out and tell the disciples. He'll see him later. Right? Matthew 16, verse 5 and 6. But usually at that point of the story, the Easter pageant's over. At that point of the story, he's alive, he's alive forevermore. Oh, no, wait, wait, keep going, keep going. We need to hear the angelic dialogue that's important. Because it is. But that's where it stops. Then from there and skip to, thank you for coming, see you next year. Right? Look at Luke 23. If you're going to perform the events, perform the events. Don't stop short. Luke 23, verse 4. Empty tomb. Now, I need 24, verse 4, I think. Luke 24, verse 4. Luke 24, 4. They entered in. Here's the ladies once again. They found the stone rolled away. They entered in in verse 3. They found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, there's the empty tomb right there, right? They found not the body. So the body was supposed to be there. The body wasn't there. But there was things in the tomb, the angels being in the tomb. Verse 4, it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, there about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, the ladies were afraid, they bowed down their faces to the earth, and they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Thus the Christian prays, he is risen. And indeed he is, he was, the angel said so. They told the women that. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Remember that? And they remembered his words, the ladies remembered. They remembered then. They had forgotten. And when Jesus told them, they didn't understand it. Luke 18, 18 says that. Look at John 20, verse 6. Mary Magdalene. If you're going to play Mary Magdalene in the Easter pageant, you've got to know how to cry. But you got to do more than that. If you play Mary Magdalene in the Easter pageant, you've got to know how to cry, and you have to know how to run away from the tomb yelling, someone stole the body. And I've never heard that in any Easter pageant. No. Imagine that. You get the tomb, stone rolled away, a lady runs out going, they stole the body! Like that, That's like the heckler ruining the Easter pageant. You're ruining the moment! But John 20, verse 6. <clears throat> Look at verse 2. Here's where she runs away. Verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark in the sepulcher. Seeing the stone taken away from the sepulcher, then she runs and comes to Simon Peter. She saw the stone rolled away, right? Then she runs, comes to Peter. 
The other disciple whom Jesus loved and says it to him, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they laid him. There it is. Someone stole the body. Peter therefore went forth. The other disciple who came to the sepulcher, they ran both together. The other disciple did outrun Peter. I don't, that's, anyway. And he came first to the sepulcher. Competition among these guys is ridiculous. He stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying. So what's in the tomb? Is it empty? John specifically points out what's in the tomb is linen clothes. Yeah. Now why is that important? Well, there's no body in it. That's one reason. Number two is if it was grave robbers, why didn't they take the linen clothes? Like, that's some nice laundry there. I mean, the body is corrupt, but you know, take the clothes. That's why grave robbers rob the graves. It's for the treasures, it's not for the bodies, right? So the idea of the body being stolen without the linen tells you what? Not grave robbers, right? So Mary says someone stole the body. The disciples go on and go, good theory, Mary, but there's linen clothes there. Detective Peter and John say, right? If we were to steal the body, what would we do with a dead body? But those clothes cost some money and they left them behind. And beyond that, it says in verse seven, the napkin that was about his head, not laying with linen clothes, but wrapped together. It was folded together, wrapped together in a place by itself. Well, who does that? I'm gonna take this body because I love dead bodies and I'm gonna fold this napkin up over there and leave. And so, so all this is evidence to something that he's risen from the dead. This is interesting details here. Why isn't this depicted in the Easter pageant? Oh, because the tomb's rolled away. The yeah, tomb's empty. The tomb's rolled away. It's done. No, you're just beginning the proving of his resurrection. Amen. And you're not really proving it, but keep going in the scripture. The scripture does a better job of proving the resurrection than any Easter pageant you've ever seen. Because just because a friend in your church walks out of an empty tomb doesn't mean Christ rose from the dead. Right? Or are you so gullible to believe whatever story the town puts on for you this is God's word right here. Yeah. So the tomb wasn't entirely empty. Mary was weeping at the tomb. If you go down to verse uh, eight, uh, back down in verse eight, it says, then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. So there it is. John came in, he believed. Finally, someone believes in the resurrection. No, verse nine, as yet they knew not the scripture, they knew us rising from the dead. What they believed is that the body was gone. Yeah. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. He said, no, no, I think they believed that he rose from the dead. I think that was their theory. Verse 11, then why was Mary standing without the sepulcher weeping? And as she wept, she stooped down and looked at the sepulcher and seeing two angels, see there's things in the tomb again. There's a lot of interesting activity going on in this tomb. Why is that in the scripts? And seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, woman, why weepest thou? So good, we get some insight into the psychology of Mary here. Because they have taken away my Lord. Yeah, and I know not where they have laid him. We've lost the body. Remember, she was coming to anoint the body. Yeah. She can't do what she intended to do out of a loving act towards her dead Lord, right? She doesn't yet know he rose from the dead. It. It's not until she turns around and sees Jesus that that changes. So what's the proof of his resurrection? Is it the empty tomb? Nope. Is it even the linen clothes? Nope. That just proved they were pretty bad grave robbers, or they were. What proved his resurrection was when Jesus himself was standing next to her. Amen. And thus, Christians have him walking out of the tomb, right? But people are very fast and loose with the scriptural account. That's what I'm trying to point out to you. There's things that are left out. There's details missing. There's things lost over. There's things that are invented to cover up the, the gaps. Did Jesus carry the cross? How, how many of you have envisioned in your brain the depictions of a bloody, beaten Jesus carrying a cross, with the whole cross, right? Fallen down once, twice, three times, the stations of the cross have Jesus falling down three times. The Bible never mentions him falling down even once. Amen. So wouldn't you fall down? You've been beaten up and bloodied. Well, okay, sure, you're, but you're inventing that. See, the scripture doesn't say it. But did Jesus even carry the cross? Say, Justin, come on, please, you're questioning Jesus carrying the cross. We have a guy every year that takes that cross and walks down the street in the, in the, in the church. And Did Jesus carry the cross? He, didn't Jesus say, you have to take up your cross and follow me? If he didn't take up the cross, what are they doing? Do you think by taking up the cross, he actually meant for everyone to take a literal cross, put it on their back? It's about suffering, right? Amen. Following him in suffering and death. Did Jesus actually carry the cross? Why is this important? 
It's only important because people are trying to depict what happened. If they're making things up, they're not biblically accurate. Did he carry the cross? In Matthew, let's go to Matthew real quick here. Just to show you. Some of you are in, in disbelief, I can see. Suspended. He definitely died on a cross. We know he died on a cross. That's clear. Are you saved by him carrying the cross or dying on the cross? Amen. Praise God, you know the truth. You're saved by his death on the cross, not how much he carried the cross. But in some traditions, that's the same thing. That's why you walk the Via de la Rosa. Because redemption and forgiveness comes from you taking part in the sufferings of Jesus, which means you walk in the sufferings he walked, which means you do what he did in his sufferings, and that's how your sins can be forgiven as well. The cross is just one of those things. But if you preach the cross of Christ and his death on the cross for your forgiveness of sins, it doesn't matter who carried the cross, right? Except for what the Bible says, which matters greatly. Look at Matthew 27. Someone might have to help me find the verse here. Drop down to verse, oh, I found it, verse 31. Matthew 27, verse 29. When they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and he reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They beat him, they mocked him. They spit upon him, they took the reed, they smote him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him. They had a robe, a scarlet robe, or was it a purple robe? Scarlet or purple? Both. Both. They put it on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, leading him away to crucify him, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by the name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Who carried the cross? Simon of Cyrene. Sometimes you'll find Simon in the Easter pageants, most often not, right? Yep. Mark says the same thing. Mark says they led him to be crucified, and they found Simon and said, you, you carry the cross. Why would they do that? Well, if Jesus was beat up as much as people depict him to be, then that may be a reason. But I would also suggest you read the context here and the details so you know what the Bible says, because there's so much time. And again, I, that's why I asked how much is, is vision in your head about the bloody, beat-up Jesus. How many verses in the Bible describe the beatings that Jesus took? you might see that they've been exaggerated. I am not trying to diminish Christ's sufferings or what happened to him, but simply that Christians disproportionately spend time on the actual beatings of Jesus and less on the things that were actually happening in the Bible. Okay? What I read to you, and this is that verse and a half about the mocking and the scourging, that is the beatings of Jesus. Does anyone know what a cat of nine tails are? Everyone's saying yes. How do you know? The Bible doesn't mention it. Oh, because someone who understood Jewish and Roman history told us about cat and nine tails. They had to be the cat and nine tails that whipped Jesus. Whipped Jesus. When was he whipped? Well, it says he was scourged, and scourged means whipping. He must have been whipped 40 times according to Roman tradition. Sure, tradition. Now we're talking about tradition, aren't we? You see what I'm talking about? It's real quick that people get off to tradition and not from Scripture. Could it be true? Sure. Is it what the Bible says? No. This is the inspired words of God. When you go outside of this, now you're entering tradition that you must accept on a different level of understanding. Could that human tradition be wrong? Very well could be. Is it? Doesn't have to be, right? Is this book wrong? No. You see the difference, right? You should prioritize what this book prioritizes. You should follow what this book says as being the authoritative word of God. Where it doesn't speak, maybe you shouldn't speak so much. Amen. It's sometimes, it's good to study history and context, and so you get a picture sometimes of that, but you know what? This is the book God gave you to understand. So sometimes things are missing, and you don't really have to know them. Sometimes that's the case. Maybe it's not important for you to know and see how much blood fell out of Jesus' body, but to know that when they pierced his side, blood and water fell out, that his blood was shed for you. What about Luke 23, 38? How often do you find in Easter pageants when Jesus carries his cross? Now, by the way, in the book of John, it does mention Jesus bearing his cross, but it doesn't mention anything about Simon. It doesn't mention anything about him leading him out. So the dispute is whether or not he actually picked up the cross or whether that was just him suffering. Do I think Jesus carried a cross? Sure, why not? I'm telling you it's not important for my salvation. Right. But in Luke 23, verse 38, here's a detail missing from the Easter pageants is him preaching wrath to the women. Wrath to come. One of the stations of the cross, 
does get a detail that's often missing in Easter presentations, which is uh, Jesus addressing the daughters of Jerusalem, right? Which is very interesting, because usually Jesus is depicted as silently suffering and as the lamb, you know, leading up to the cross and that sort of thing. Luke 23, verse 38, excuse me, um, 28, 23, 28. So the verse 27, there followed him as Simon the Cyrenian was carrying his cross in verse 26. And verse 27, there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem. So here's Jesus preaching something on the Via de la Rosa, on the way to the cross. Have you ever heard this before? If you're a Catholic, you say, oh yeah, I've heard that station of the cross. But if you're not, you've probably never heard this. He says, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. Yeah. Huh? He says, and for your children, for behold, the days are, why is he saying weep for your children? He's going to say it because they're going to be destroyed. Like he's not, not genocidally. He's talking about the wrath that's to come. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paths which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in, in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? What is he saying? He's saying, why are you crying for me? Judgment's going to come. Wow. Wow. He's saying, they're killing me, judgment's gonna come, right? They're beating me, they're rejecting me, they're gonna get punished. That's what he's teaching. But that doesn't flow very well with the God commended his love towards you while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you in Romans 5 verse 8 according to the mystery, which is truly what was going on. But according to prophecy, Jesus says, these are according to prophecy, and prophecy is going to be fulfilled, and that part of that prophecy is judgment upon those who reject me. He's, even as he's going to the cross, he's preaching, receive me and get salvation, or reject me and get wrath. Right? Just a detail that's often left out of the Easter story. What did Jesus look like? If I draw a man like this, who is that guy? That's Jesus. White robe, blue sash, right? Sometimes purple. Where in the Bible does it say Jesus wore a blue or purple sash? Except for when the soldiers mocked him and put on an entire robe of purple and ripped it off before he got crucified. But why would his clothes be that glimmering white? He wasn't rich by earthly means, right? So again, something else used to depict and symbolize that Jesus is the perfect son of God, so we're going to make his clothes very clean, and he's the king of kings, so we're going to give him a color of kings. Not in the Bible. It's not there. I want the long hair. You can go into the details of the way Jesus looked, which they do every year. What was it last year? The Christian Day Today said Jesus was probably like, more like an Asian person. Yeah, that's a stretch, too. He was Mideastern, not Far Eastern. Right? But did Jesus look like Liam Neeson? You can find a list of actors who have played Jesus, Liam Neeson being one of them. What a Jesus that would be. Christian Bale, William Dafoe, that wasn't too bad actually, except for the her heresy in the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. Or Robert Powell, the leading actor of who played Jesus, that guy. That's how Jesus looked. How do you know? See, people look at the performance, the emotionalism, they say, that's how I picture my Jesus. Maybe you should read the scripture to learn about what Jesus is and what he said. Amen. I know we're talking about a lot of details and myths that may be trivial to some people, but no one thinks that the National Institute of Standards and Measurements in the government, NIST, should be lacking precision. No one thinks the very NFL, which is a game, folks, should be lacking precision. You know, there are details in the NFL playbook of how wide the side margins and the, and the, and the first down marking should be. You know those lines are four inches wide, right? Some of you go, no. Some of you go, yeah, of course, of course, four inches, four, four inches. Like, you ever seen a measure the first down? Like, some of you go, no. <laughs> no, it's football, what's going on? They got the chains, right? Why do they have the chains? Can't they eyeball it? It's what you did in flag football when you were younger. You're like, yeah, to the tree, right? First down. <laughs> no, NFL, <sighs> get that chain, it's stretching out there. Everyone's going, please. Nope, <laughs> didn't hit that blade of grass. Jesus didn't walk out of the tomb. Ah, oh, Justin, what are you doing? Your precision in the Bible. <laughs> I care. I care. Right? If you're going to depict it, I care. 
God's church gets a pass on that. At least they're trying to entertain people with biblical ideas. The church is the pillar on the ground of the truth. Amen. It is the, 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 the one who's supposed to be holding the truth. Leave the stories and the paraphrases for people's own time when the church ministers make sure it's the standard. Very creative, William Defoe. But you know what the Bible says this, and that's incorrect. <laughs> Very imaginative depiction of what maybe could have happened. Probably didn't because the Bible says this. That never happens. Christians praise all sorts of loose paraphrases and depictions of the Scripture because they're just trying to get anything, for people to watch anything, listen to anything about the Bible. The empty tomb, as we covered, mentioned before, even if the tomb was empty, which we know there's linen clothes, there was angels in there, even though his body wasn't found, right? The empty tomb itself, if you leave the Easter pageant believing the tomb was empty, if that's what you're trying to show people, that the tomb was empty, and they go, okay, uh, you've depicted for me in this play, therefore I conclude historically that it must have occurred, because you guys would never lie to me, that the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. Does that prove the resurrection? No. Because what did Mary say? Stole the body. Bodies have gone missing, folks. You don't want to think about it, but they have. Missing bodies does not mean they're resurrected. No one knows where Moses was buried. It doesn't mean he rose from the dead. Okay? The many people have been lost to history, don't know where their bodies are at, does not mean they've risen from the dead. The empty tomb does not equal resurrection. Be careful with the communication. Now, Christians use things like that all the time to conflate ideas. They say empty tomb, meaning resurrection. Even the Bible talks about preaching the cross, which means preaching the cross, including the resurrection, right? If you take the preaching the cross to exclude the resurrection, you're not preaching the cross properly, are you? So, understand what you're saying. Luke 24, when Peter saw the empty tomb, he wondered what that meant. And so, it did not mean he just rose from the dead. If Easter's goal is to show the empty tomb, then it stops short of the proof. Look at Luke 24. The proof of Christ's resurrection comes much after the empty tomb, which is an important part of the story, of the events, of the reality, of the history. And that's why Luke doesn't stop there. Luke 24, 37. Verse 36 says, As they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. His disciples were speaking together and eat, breaking bread. And Jesus appeared in the midst of them. He stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen a spirit. Even when Jesus stood amongst them and spoke, what do people say today about the resurrection who don't believe it, like the events? They say they saw a vision. They were hallucinated. That's exactly what the Bible indicates as well in that they saw him speak and heard him speak and they were afraid thinking they saw a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, right? Pinch yourself. And he says, pinch me, right? This is not a dream. I am not a spirit. This is real. My body is real. I'm risen from the dead. That's pretty good evidence of the resurrection. Amen. Anyone today would say the same thing. Okay, if you're totally skeptic, you would say there's nothing that can prove the resurrection to me because I'll have to touch his body. Well, there's someone in the Bible who said that too. Yeah. Thomas. Yeah. He said, I would not believe until I touch his body. Yeah. And Jesus appeared to these guys and he said, touch me. Yeah. Verse 40. You know how hard it is to get people to believe the resurrection? Yeah. Like, resurrection is a crazy miracle, folks. It's like the dead person just came back alive. Yeah. How do you know that? How do you know it wasn't hallucination? How do you know someone didn't steal the body? The Muslims think he didn't even die on the cross. Yeah. Right? When he had thus spoken, he showed them. You've got to know this as a Christian, because if you're trying to show and prove the resurrection on this holy day of resurrection, and you just say, look, the tomb's empty. Of course he rose from the dead. You know how ignorant you sound, yeah. right? The Bible itself gives you the proof. You have to keep reading. Amen. When he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were yet believed, and this is why your pastor playing Jesus has the little red marker marks on his hands, and he comes out of the tomb and says, look, right? Because that's what Jesus did. But your pastor's not Jesus, right? While they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have you here any meat? So even when he showed them his hands, they yet believed not for joy. They're like, could it be? But I don't know. He says, give me some food. And he takes it and crunches it up, right? Or, or you know, whatever. They gave him a piece of boiled fish and a honeycomb. He took it and did eat before them. But even then, people were in disbelief. 
If you saw Jesus, if you saw him, there is still room for you to go, I don't believe it. I, I'm, I took too much Dayquil yesterday. I don't know what happened, right? Verse 44, what, must, what is the, the biggest evidence? What's the, the, the most important proof of his resurrection? I win his testimony, sure. Look at verse 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. You want to know if the events of the Bible were true? Understand the prophecies. The Bible was not written all at once. Things were described and things occurred exactly as they were described hundreds of years before. That's called prophecy. How is that possible? We've gone beyond you visually seeing something and you thinking in your mind of how that's possible. Can't be possible. It's impossible. Only God can do this. Right? And yet Christians say it shouldn't just be something you think about. It should be something you feel. Right? The emotions. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What's he, Jesus doing? He himself is resurrected and he's proving to the disciples as a resurrected person how his resurrection is true. From the scriptures. You see that? How would we think that we should do it as Christians? We should recreate the empty tomb. Maybe we should use the scriptures. Hmm? Maybe we should show them to understand the scriptures. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day. And he goes on to talk about this. And he says, ye are witnesses of these things. In verse 49. The repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. They saw him. It's not necessary for us to see the empty tomb or even Christ to believe in the resurrection. But if that's true, right? Is that true? The 11 disciples believed Thomas wasn't there. And Tom, they came and told Thomas, and Thomas said, unless I see, I won't believe. Jesus appears to Thomas, says, touch me. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Yeah. He believed, and Jesus says, blessed are you. But ble he said, blessed are those who don't see and believe. Because that means they're believing without seeing. That's faith. Yeah. Right? We don't need to see the empty tomb or even Christ to believe if we understand the words of God and believe them. All right? And that's the tool God's given us. If he wanted us to re recreate the empty tomb event every Passion Week, he would have given us a pretty better, a, a better script to do it by. He gave us the word of God to teach. Eyewitnesses are necessary for those who wrote the word of God, not for you who don't have to write the word of God. You know the best eyewitnesses, by the way? If you're looking for eyewitness testimony of the resurrection, and there's hundreds of them in the scripture, the best eyewitnesses are those who are unbelievers before they saw. Yeah. Because those who are believers, when they claim to see Jesus, you could say, well, you just loved him so much. Yeah. You know. But if you're an unbeliever before, and then you said, no, I believe now because I saw him yeah. alive after his death, that'd be a pretty good testimony, wouldn't it? There is actually a man in the Bible like that. The Apostle Paul was the chief persecutor of the Christians. He wasn't just another unbeliever, like James, the Lord's brother. He, he was actually the one persecuting those who claimed that Jesus rose from the dead, saying, you guys are teaching blasphemy and lies contrary to what God says. And he was putting them in jail, slaughtering them. And then that man says, I now preach the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. And not just the resurrection, but as we'll see here in a moment this mystery revelation that this resurrected Christ gave to me. Amen. It's not just that I believe now that it happened. Now I believe what it can do in me and in you. What? Paul preaches the power of resurrection that was never preached before because the resurrected Christ gave him the message that contained that power, Amen. the power of the gospel of Christ. Person one thirteen says, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. Then he saw. He was a witness. 1 Corinthians 5, 15, verse 5. You know, we know verse 3, 3 through 4. Many of you know it by heart. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried in the third day. He rose from the dead. You know what the next few words are? I printed them on the balloons this last fair time. We had balloons. We put the verse on there. And I added words that we hardly ever quote, which are very important for the resurrection, which is, and he was seen. Because you can say he rose from the dead according to the scriptures, and the scriptures are the proof that you should believe. And when Paul says, and he was seen, his testimony that he himself was an eyewitness and proof of the resurrection. Paul's apostleship, this man right here, his salvation is definitive proof of Christ's resurrection. You know why, right? He was the chief persecutor and blasphemer. He was the one that, that helped stone Stephen. He would have rejected Christ on the cross. And over here, he's preaching that as necessary for salvation. 
how do you, how do you, how do you get that transformation? Right? He, he claimed eyewitness. He claimed understanding the scriptures. Paul did not see the empty tomb, folks. No evidence of it. He did not talk to Peter. Galatians 1, he says that outright. He said, I didn't go to Peter. Christ came to me. Right? The resurrected Christ came to me. Christ appeared to him. In fact, Christ reappeared to him by his grace. At Easter, people talk about the resurrection of Christ, and they show the depiction of the empty tomb and his resurrection to the earth, and sometimes his ascension. But that is the resurrected, glor glorified Christ appearing to his chief enemy, giving the ultimate testimony, not only of his resurrection, but also the 13 epistles that describe the gospel of the grace of God and the teaching of the church. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. And here's what we're doing today. What have we done? We've stopped short. Yes? If people leave Easter today believing in the empty tomb, they might still have doubts about either Christ's resurrection or, or more importantly, why he resurrected. Because yeah. you know what it requires for you to understand why he resurrected? Some explanation. Some, some revelation. Some understanding. Easter ends with an empty tomb. Paul's gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 begins with one. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul says, If Christ be not risen, you're yet in your sins. Well, that's significant. Because here Mary thought that someone stole the body, and she was a believer. She thought that she'd be with Christ on that day. Right? But Paul says, if you don't know he rose from the dead, you're still in your sins. Which means you and I can have our sins forgiven right now through the power of belief in that resurrection of Christ as he revealed in Scripture. What we need to do, folks, as a church is to leave Easter behind with the empty tomb. The empty tomb was real. Easter was man-made, but the empty tomb was real. Not only the empty tomb, but the events that the Bible describes about it, his resurrection and his reappearance and revelation of the mystery of the Apostle Paul, all of that was real. The most important part of that resurrection is what comes after it, is the explanation. But Easter and its celebration knows nothing of the revelation of the body of Christ and the revelation of the mystery. It doesn't know it because it comes much after. So why is that important? Because it's there where you find the gospel that saves you. This, these are the events, and this is the explanation. Amen. Without the explanation, what do you got? The event without understanding. And so you have many Christians in churches who participate in Easter understanding of the event, and many of them believe, in fact, they did a survey of how many Americans believe in the resurrection. It says two-thirds of Americans, 66% of Americans, believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. Now, I, I, I doubt the poll a little bit, but Assuming the thing's true, it's interesting because not that many people actually go to church every week. Yeah. According to other surveys about the American population, not that many people actually trust Christ's finished work. Which means more people believe that Christ rose from the dead than do understand the gospel that saves them. I wonder why that is. Maybe because Christianity is about two things. Holiday speaking. His birth and his empty tomb. What about the explanation? It takes a theologian or someone who has understanding of the Bible to, to put on those two events the understanding of them, right? But if people are just watching the performances, they're going, yeah, he was a baby and he died and the tomb was empty. He rose from the dead. That's what Christianity is about. But how are you saved? You know, I don't know. I struggle with that one, but Christ rose from the dead. How does that apply to you? I don't know. I don't know why he had to die, but he rose from the dead. He was powerful. Yes, the gospel is that power that he exhibited is now given to you when you believe the gospel, Amen. such that the tomb that was empty, the death of Christ is now your death, and the resurrection of Christ is now your resurrection. Amen. Is that ever taught? He rose from the dead so that you can rise from the dead, not only in the future, but now you can walk in newness of life. That's, That's the teaching of Scripture. You can learn the true meaning of Easter and be ignorant of the gospel that saves. Paul, the revelation of the mystery of Christ, that Christ appeared to Paul. Here's Christ up here. Paul moves on to the understanding, to the, the meaning of the resurrection according to the mystery. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, he talks about how Christ was the first fruits. Mary and Peter didn't even know he rose from the dead. There's no way they were explaining this. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, you say, well, they understood at Pentecost. Well, then it's not Easter anymore, is it? <laughs> Whoops. 
Verse 15, verse 20. Brethren, be not children understanding, how be in malice be ye children. Uh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Chapter 15, verse 20. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Of course, that's true. Christ is risen from the dead. He was risen from the dead years ago, Paul. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become, see the and become part? And become the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. Christ rose from the dead, yes, and he's now become the first fruits. Like, you're going to participate in this. Yeah. And it's not a reenactment of the empty tomb. It's his actual resurrection. Verse 21, for since by man came the death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all day, die, even so in Christ, notice the verses, shall all be made alive. Do you see that? Shall be made alive? Salvation, note this, salvation does not come by Christ's still being alive. Salvation comes by you being made alive in him. Amen. Do you understand the difference? It is true that Christ is risen. It is true that he's alive. But that does not affect your salvation unless you know the gospel by which you're made alive in him. Right? That's important. Romans 6, 4, but now Christ reveals not only his resurrection, that he not only did the resurrection already, he reveals your resurrection in him. He says, if you're baptized into his death, then you're baptized into his resurrection Amen. so you can walk in newness of life. Look at Colossians 2, verse 12. Notice the empty tomb here, and I say that loosely because that's not the term. The burial. The, empty, the tomb is the burial, right? They buried him in a tomb. Colossians 2, verse 12. You're complete in Christ, Colossians 2, verse 10 says, buried with him in baptism. Do you see that? Paul is saying, you're in the empty tomb. You're in the tomb that's not been empty. You're buried with him, where it also you are risen with him. Amen. See how Paul teaches the empty tomb? He died, he was put in a tomb, he emptied it, he rose from the dead. You are buried with him and are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. So is that teaching the fact of resurrection? It is. Is it teaching about the power of the resurrection in you? More importantly, yes. You see what Paul's teaching here? This is why resurrection is the foundation of the church, because the resurrection began the church when it was revealed what that thing did. But they didn't know what happened back here. They might have some, some consequences for the beginning of the church, I think. Colossians 3, 1, if you then be risen with Christ, if you're risen with him, if your tomb is empty, if you're risen with him, seek those things that are above, where Christ is in the right hand of God. See, the resurrection speaks to how you live your life now, too, because you're in him by resurrection. Look all the way down here. It says in verse 5, mortify your members which are upon the earth. Jeremy covered that last Tuesday. Put on the new man in verse 10, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. The new creature can only exist because the resurrection of Christ revealed the power of it in saving men by grace through faith. Amen. Faith requires you understanding what Christ did and why. Salvation is by grace through faith. Peter didn't even have the Holy Ghost, folks. When he saw Jesus rose from the dead, when he ate the honeycomb with him, when he was told by the scriptures that he fulfilled all things, Peter didn't even have the Holy Ghost. When you believe the gospel of your salvation today, that Christ did everything necessary to save your soul, that he died on the cross, was buried, rose again the third day, then you receive the Holy Ghost, the spirit of promise, Amen. to help you live this resurrected life in Christ. And that's the truth. Peter didn't have the Holy Ghost, nor did he preach this mystery and glory of this mystery, which means Easter, which is over here, is empty of this truth, yes. the more important, more excellent resurrection of Christ according to Paul's gospel, which is the foundation of the church. Any comments or questions about, about that? Hopefully that helps put things in perspective.